Well, good morning, and we want to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we gather around together as brothers and sisters in Christ, remembering the Lord, that we should always pray in the Holy Spirit, be encouraged through the Word of God, and to always be meditating on the Word of God day and night. Welcome again to the Christ Jesus College and Seminary and the Christ Jesus Chapel. This will be a wonderful time for you to click and subscribe to our channel. Uh, everything here is free. Our desire is to preach and teach the unfiltered, raw, inerrant Word of God. And we welcome all of you, whether as viewers, or as participants in our Bible College and our accelerated programs for theology and divinity, you're most welcome. Uh, and we encourage you also to share this link with other believers. We also, we, uh, we implore you, we persuade you to share this link with others who need to know the Lord. And we also encourage you to click on the notification bell so that all the upcoming symposiums and sermons and lectures and conferences and all these blessings will, will be coming your way. We ask the Lord to bless our time together. We welcome this morning Nora. And we also bless this morning Bishop Uda, who is with us, faithful 1212, and his encouragement and we pray for all our Bible scholars here and around the world. Now, if you've missed the, the, the lecture, the sermon on Gethsemane, feel free to go back and to review it. It is where Jesus really won the victory at Calvary. It is probably the most prominent prayer in the entire Bible. And if you haven't had the opportunity to really study and to really enjoy that prominent prayer, I do encourage you to do so. So this morning we're going to be looking at the arrest of Jesus Christ. It deserves our attention to understand how Jesus was arrested, the treason that was involved, the illegal nature of how it was done, the deception, the fraud, how it fulfilled the scriptures, which is going to be another topic by the will of God of the Lord Tarius next week. And some very salient points in this chapter of Mark, as we, as we study, we've been studying now the, the life of Jesus, no other better life, no better biography than the, the life of Jesus. And if you would turn with me, we are in the 14th chapter of Mark. And we're going to be reading from verses 43 and onwards, I believe from 43 to 52. So I'll give you a moment to open your Bibles. We welcome Carl this morning. May God richly bless you. And we thank you for your prayers and for your encouragement. We know that we cannot do anything on our own. It is only through the grace of God that we are able to serve him. We are nothing. He is everything. I'm a nobody who became somebody through Jesus Christ. And so here we are in Mark chapter 14, and we're going to start with verse 43. And, and the Lord will bless the reading of his word. And immediately, while Jesus yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, and the chief priests, and the scribes, and the elders. And Judas, that betrayed him, had given them a token, saying, Whomever, Whoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him, and lead him away safely. As soon as Judas was come, Judas goeth straight away to Jesus and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. 
this is a very important part for us, I think, here to pause for a moment. Jesus had been teaching and preaching in the temple, in the outer courts. He never taught in the inner sanctuaries. He stayed outside with the people in the outer courts to preach, to teach the gospel, and to heal, and often take the audacious questions and depositions of the scribes and the elders and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they had every opportunity to arrest Jesus if they wanted to in broad daylight. But if you know anything about scripture, right beside the temple was the garrison of the Roman soldiers that were under the command of Pilate. That famous fortress still stands today as the Wailing Wall, because we know from scripture that Jerusalem <clears throat> and the temple were completely decimated as prophesied by Jesus in 70 AD. And on top of the temple, you would have the Roman guard patrolling the very top of the temple of, of God and the walls around Jerusalem. And so making an arrest of Jesus in broad daylight with all his followers, with all the people, especially during the time of Passover, the, that holy day of the year, would have been truly a very public event. And so we see here that Judas, in a very wicked, evil, deceitful act of treason, has betrayed the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the creator of heavens and the earth, to the children of darkness. This could only have happened in darkness. This could have only happened when the sunlight was not shining because the children of darkness came out in the dark and they took and they captured the author of the word of God, the creator of the universe, the creator of you and myself. And it is very telling here because it says here in verse, 40, uh, in verse uh, 43 that a great multitude, a great multitude came out to get Jesus. Now, Jesus didn't need any bodyguards. Jesus had legions of angels at his disposal. They didn't capture Jesus. Jesus surrendered himself to the authorities. That scripture might be fulfilled. I want you to tune in next week so we can go over all the plethora of verses in the Old Testament that had to be fulfilled regarding the capture, the arrest, the torture, the trials, all the fake trials, and the passion and death, and the wonderful resurrection and ascension and coronation of Jesus. And so they come in a great multitude in darkness. And that's how evil works, my friend. They work in the dark. They work in large groups because they themselves are afraid. And they do things behind people's backs. And you cannot trust man. The Bible says it's better to trust in the Lord than to trust in princes. And I pray that this morning that you're not trusting in man, that you're trusting in the Lord. Yes, there may be delays. Yes, there may be speed bumps, but the Lord directs our steps. The Lord directs our steps. And it's very important to notice here that they come with swords and, and, and staves. Now, the guards of the Sanhedrin are not allowed to carry swords. And so we know that there is a contingency of Roman soldiers that are hidden in this group. And that we know also early in Scripture it says that the Pharisees and the scribes plotted with the Herodians to kill Jesus. And so we know that here we have three groups of people. The chief priests, which were the Pharisees, the scribes, which were the lawyers, and the elders. And so we see 
everyone that is in high regard uh, in the rabbinical world, in the legal world, um, even in the business world, they were completely dead set against Jesus. And Jesus that betrayed him gave them a token. He said, I'm going to take you to Jesus. I know what Gethsemane is. This will be an opportune time for you to capture him. And I'm going to give you a token. And what was that token? He says, whoever, whoever I, I shall kiss, that same as he, take him and lead him away safely. Now, mind you, Judas is not concerned about the safety of Jesus. Judas is not concerned about Jesus being taken away safe. He knows that this act of treason, this kiss, which is known as the kiss of death, is going to be very harsh and very lethal on Jesus. And he does it for money. What prompted that was, just before this, a woman comes with an alabaster box and customarily, this came from India, and it was a very exotic perfume. And people would take a little dab, and they would just be smelling wonderful and aromatic all day long. And this woman comes to worship the Lord and to prepare his body for his burial. And she takes the whole box, which is a year's wages, and she lavishly pours it in worship at the Lord's feet. And this is the breaking point for Judas, because Judas said, what a waste of money. What an irresponsible way to use our money, because he was the treasurer. He was holding the money for the disciples. And it's noted in scripture that he was also dipping in and he was embezzling the money. And that was the breaking point where he went to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the the high priest and the elders, and he took a small portion of money to trade away the greatest man that ever lived on the face of the earth, our Lord Jesus. And so he was mainly concerned about his safety. I want you to capture him, but I want to be safe. Now it says here, as soon as Judas was come, Judas goes straight away, straight away to Jesus and said, Master, Master, and kissed him. Now, I've always encouraged all of you to have many different biblical aids as you're reading the Living Bible, the King James Bible. And when you read in the interlinear Bible and you look at this word kissed in the Greek, and don't be fooled by Hollywood, my friends, this is not a little peck on the, the cheek. This is a very impassioned kiss. He came to him and said, Rabbi, Rabbi, or Master, Master. And he comes and he gives him this long, affectionate, prolonged kiss, more than likely on the cheek, because that was a customary way of greeting your rabbi, greeting your, your, your master. It was a sign of affection. It was a sign of honor. But here it's nothing more than an act of hate, deceit, treason. And I'm reminded of Proverbs 26, 7, where it says, faithful are the wounds of your friend. If you have a true friend, he will have wounds on his body because he is faithful to you. But the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. My friends, the Christian church today has many enemies in many places. Don't be fooled, my friends. Things are not going to go normal. We're heading into a time where things are getting darker. And as Christians, we need to be more into the word of God. But more importantly, we need to be praying in the Holy Spirit and to be prepared as Jesus. My friend, your, your spiritual life is only as good as your prayer life. And if you're hardly praying, you're hardly getting by. Praying the Holy Spirit is exactly what Jesus did in Gethsemane. And, he, and Jesus was very specific. He asked if the cup could be passed. Could this cup be passed from me? He asked three times. And God said, this cup is the only way that we, we can redeem mankind, that we can redeem Ramsey, that we can redeem Bishop Philip, 
and all the Christians and all the true believers. And Jesus said, thy will be done. Now, there are many scary parts in the Bible. This past Thursday night at the men's leadership Bible study that we have every Thursday night, we were reading from Matthew 23, and it was very frightening when Jesus was giving the kiss off to Jerusalem and said, I am leaving your house desolate, and from here on in you will not see me anymore until you learn, until Israel learns to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, that, that's frightening, that when God shows you his love and then he comes to a point and says, you're just not listening, and if you want to go your own way, then go ahead, but you're going to pay the consequences all by yourself. But there's another frightening passage that comes to mind here. And it's in Matthew 7. Now, Jesus had just finished teaching on the Mount of Beatitudes, and it is truly one of the most principal sermons that Jesus gives. They're the rules of the kingdom of heaven. And at the very end of chapter 7, verses 21 and 23, mark these words. Don't miss this. He says, not everyone who says to me, this is Jesus speaking. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Did you notice that uh, Judas said, Rabbi, Rabbi, Master, Master. Did you notice that? And look at what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You see, not everyone who says, Jesus Christ is my Savior. Not everyone who says, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior is really a born-again Christian. It's the person who does the will. It's the person who obeys. If you're truly a Christian, you want to be obedient to Jesus, not because you have to, but because you want to, because you're an absolute love. You're an absolute adoration of your Lord, what he's done for you on the cross. He saved you from hell. He saved you from darkness. He's filled you with his Holy Spirit. He's given you his word. He is with you always. He's in you, with you, around you. And my, my friends, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't know what you're missing. It is a joy that is unspeakable. You know, my daughter was talking to me the other day ago. She goes, you know, are there any parts of the Bible that says that Jesus was smiling? Did he laugh? Well, I couldn't recall any scripture that specifically said that he did laugh. But we do know that happiness comes and goes. But Jesus was always filled with something more important than happiness. Because, you know, happiness depends on happenings. Jesus was filled with joy. And joy is far more, more important than happiness. But look how this finishes. He says, on that day, what day? Day of the day of the harvest. When Jesus comes again, he's coming. Our friends, he's coming. We don't know the times or the season. Only God the Father will know, and he will tell Jesus to come. He says, on that day, many will say to me, again, here we go again. You're going to hear the words twice. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? These are people who are preaching and teaching. These are people who are engaged in eschatology and, and prophecy. Did we not cast out demons? These are people who, that were supposedly casting out demons in public. And did we not do, listen, listen, listen to the, 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 uh, the alliteration of these words here. Did we not do many, many things? They did many things. They're depending on their acts. They did many things, mighty things, many works. They did many mighty works in your name. Now they're calling him Lord, Lord. Jesus, uh, Judas, rather, is calling him Rabbi, Rabbi, or Master, Master. And look what Jesus says here. He says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. That's, that's frightening. That these people really believed that they were Christians. They really believed that they were the children of God. And they were involved in ministries of preaching and teaching and prophesying. 
healing people, casting out demons, and they were doing many mighty works. They, my friends, there are many ministries that are out there that are doing many mighty works. And to our eyes, it looks like they're acts of God. But on that day, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me. What does it say? You workers of lawlessness. You workers of lawlessness. This gives you a shudder to, to contemplate that this day will come and we will see this with our own eyes as the children of God. Now you have to understand that in the Jewish and the Hebraic custom, there is a very wonderful custom that is also found in the Middle East that when you want to express intense um, or very passionate or very intimate personal affection, you repeat the person's name twice. Um, that is a recognition of their name. And we find this throughout the entire Bible. Uh, it's a wonderful study. I encourage you to study it on your own. But there are 15 accounts where someone's name is mentioned twice. You know, we, we think of a Mount Moriah where Abraham had a knife and he lifted that knife and he closed his eyes and he was about to just take that, take that dagger straight into the heart of Isaac. And as he lifted that hand, he heard that voice, Abraham, Abraham, no need to do that. Stop. Now I know that you trust me. You see how God calls Abraham, Abraham. It's a sign of great affection. And here Judas is, is, is saying, Master, Master, Rabbi, Rabbi, and he's definitely the son of the devil. Did you know that Jesus said of Judas before he left the room? Because remember, he never partook of the Lord's Supper. He says, whoever betrays me, it would have been better you were never born. My friends, if you're hearing the gospel and you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it would have been better you were never born. For you to enjoy the sunlight and health and to experience all the grace of God throughout your entire life and for you to never to accept the grace and the gift of salvation. Salvation is a gift by grace. If you don't accept that gift, it would be better you were never were born because you will go to a place of utter darkness where there will be weeping in darkness, gnashing of teeth in darkness, and a place of no hope because you, re you rejected the Messiah. You rejected the Son of God. You rejected love from God. We see this again with Jacob. Jacob was afraid to go to Goshen. Jacob was a very shrewd man, but he was a holy man. He was a godly man, and he was afraid. He was afraid to go there, and God speaks to him. He speaks to us. He goes, Jacob, Jacob, don't be afraid. I know you're afraid to go there. I will go there with you. Isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus will go with us, that Jesus is with us? That is a very comforting thought, especially today. You know, in the midnight wilderness, when Moses sees now the burning bush, I can't imagine how that must have looked like. He speaks to Moses now for the very first time. Moses, Moses. See, God loves our name. When he calls our name, there's great affection when he calls our name. We think of that midnight summons of a young boy. My friends, do not, under, do not, do not underestimate little children. God calls Samuel in the middle of the night. Samuel, Samuel, and he answers, here I am, Lord, speak for your servant listens. Oh, how tender, how tender is the voice of the Lord. Do you know the voice of the Lord? 
My friends, the sheep know the shepherd. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. We think of David. Oh, what a heartbreaking cry. What a heartbreaking cry of David. Absalom. Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom. He loses his firstborn son, and David is completely brokenhearted. You see the repetition of the name, Absalom, Absalom. We see now Elijah being swished off the face of the earth, escaping death. Both Enoch and Elijah both have been taken away. Perhaps they will be the two witnesses that come to Jerusalem. Time will tell. But what was, it, what was the reaction of Elisha? He looks up at this beautiful chariot of fire, this angelic creation taking now Elijah straight into the glories of heaven and goes, my father, my father. You see, that term, that recognition, this custom of repeating the name twice to show affection and honor and love and esteem. And then we see the New Testament. Someone's very busy cooking in the kitchen, but Mary is sitting at the, at the feet of Jesus and Martha's upset. And what does Jesus say? Martha, <laughs> Martha, it's okay. It's okay. We look at just before Jesus was betrayed, he sits on the mountain, he looks at Jerusalem and goes, Jerusalem, Oh, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers its chicks. He loved Jerusalem, but Jerusalem hated Jesus and would betray him and kill him. We think of Simon. You know, Jesus was warning Simon, but Simon was not listening, my friend. Maybe God is warning you today. I hope you're listening. He goes, Simon, Simon, Satan would have you to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. It's wonderful to know that Jesus prays for us. He intercedes for us in the right hand of God. That we have here again, this rabbi, rabbi, this, this fake affectionate kiss of Judas. And we see this again on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me. What a shrill. Even the centurion, as, it was, as he was standing on that horse, looking at Jesus, dying on the cross, he knew that this man was truly the Son of God. We think of Saul on his way to Damascus, breathing out murders and threatening. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Even in his sin, God is showing Saul how much he loves him by repeating his name twice. You know, this is very frightening. There will come a time where people will say to Jesus, Lord, Lord, haven't I done all these things for you? And they're going to say it with fond intimate affection, like, hey, Jesus, oh, Lord, it's so good to see you. And what is Jesus going to say? Please leave. Depart. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity, you workers of lawlessness. And see, my friends, the question is not, do you know Jesus? The question is, does Jesus know you? And I pray this morning that you really take the time today, now, and really make sure that your confession of faith is true and accurate. Are you bearing fruit as a Christian? Are you walking and obeying Christ? Are you filled with joy? Or are you someone has de that has deceived themselves. My friends, there are many people who think they're Christians. 
but you'll know a Christian when you meet one because you will see Jesus shining in their life. You'll see joy, you'll see peace, and you'll see many answered prayers because they have an active prayer life with God because they're talking and they're listening to God. If you're a Christian and if you backslidden, we all have done it. We've all, we're all imperfect. The Bible says in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Repent. Come back. Give your life back to God. Submit yourself. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But if you're not a Christian, I implore you. I raise my heart to God in a solemn prayer that you will feel the love of God, that you can hear your name being mentioned twice, and that you will accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, not just Savior, but as your Lord. I want to thank you for your time this morning and sharing with me. I'm looking forward to sharing tomorrow's lecture about the trial at the Sanhedrin. I think it's very important to review that and see what actually happened to our Lord. I pray that this time together with you was profitable and a blessing to you. And I just want to thank you for your prayers and your encouragement. I'm just a pencil in God's hand. And I just want to just say that I love you. And I pray for, for all of you, for your safety, for your blessing, and that you will continue to grow and be encouraged. Be encouraged in Christ. Don't be discouraged. There may be delays or speed bumps. There may be things that are unexpected that are happening unto you. But God is faithful. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him, put him first, and he shall direct your paths. Thank you again, and may God richly bless you.